I'm going to be reading from uh, Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 3, verses 21 through 24. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Now I invite you to stand as you are able and join with me in our call to worship. Give thanks and praise the Lord. Even when we turned our backs on God. Our processional hymn is hymn number 64, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty. May the peace of Christ be with you. And now let us greet one another in Christ's love.
I'm reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and send rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. With this. Uh, today I want to share with you about a season of life. Heather and I were in Pleasant View, uh, serving at the Methodist Church there uh, in Cheatham County from 2003 to 2009. Uh, if you're not familiar, Pleasant View is about halfway between Nashville and Clarksville on Interstate 24. And when we were there, it, it was becoming a bedroom community of Nashville, and it's still even and more so that. Uh, but, but really, the main pillars of the community were a Dollar General store and an IGA food market. If you needed anything more than that, then you needed to drive 15 minutes to the east of Springfield, Tennessee, and you can get just about anything you wanted there. There was a big Walmart and all those things that you might need there. And so from time to time, we would go there. And one such day, there was some things I needed to get at Walmart, so I headed that way. And it's about this time of year, early fall, uh, and, and I always, always park, still do today if I can, when I'm going to Walmart, I park over by the outdoor entrance so I can go in and see the plants and anything that's there. We see what they have, just a different perspective coming into Walmart. And I went in through there to get the things I wanted. I noticed that they had all of their outdoor furniture, all of their spring and summer stuff on clearance, getting it cleared out for the winter to start setting up for Christmas or whatever was next. Uh, and I saw this really cool looking A-frame, metal A-frame swing and it wasn't just like a wood swing like you would normally see. It had, and it had this canopy that would go over it, kind of block the, the sun from me, give you a little shade over there. And I thought, oh, man, Heather would love this. And I looked, and it was 75% off. So I thought, great deal on it. I'm going to be able to get it. It's a praying there, too. And, and, and if somebody helped me load it, and so we paid for it. Then two guys came over to help me load it into the back of my truck. And as we were about to load it, they said, well, do you think we should like disassemble it some and kind of break it down to make it easier to transport? And I said, no, no, just load it up in there. I've only got about 15 minutes back. I've got some bungee straps that I can strap it down to my, the bed of my truck. And I'll just take it slow. And everything's going to be fast. I didn't want to disrupt it. So I was going, you know, 25 miles an hour and going for a little bit. And I was like, well, this isn't bad. It's not having any problems at all. It wasn't having any sort of shifting. And I was like, well, I can go a little bit faster. So I went up to 30 miles an hour. And then 35 miles an hour. And I was getting kind of impatient. Got to 40 miles an hour. And I remember getting up to 45 miles an hour going, okay, everything looks good. I'm not going to go any. But it was still attached by those bungee cords. So they stretched along with it until it was out. And it was almost like I had a kite flying <laughs> of a swing. And it wasn't coming back down. It was just, just flying there as I was going through there. And as long as I didn't stop, everything was great. The problem was there was a four-way stop coming up. And I was afraid, what's it going to happen? What's it going to do? And, and, and sure enough, when I stopped, then it came down and landed. It hit my truck, scuffed it up a little bit. But it, you know, put some dents and some scratches and tore up part of the, the canopy was ripped and, and, and all those things. And, and I would just laugh at it 14 years ago. But I had these emotions and these feelings come up inside of me as I was thinking about that event. And I'm going, well, come on, you knew better than that. You knew that wasn't a smart thing to do over it. One of the things I've learned about myself as I've tried to become more self-aware over the last 10 years, I've learned that I have a lot of perfectionist tendencies in me. I've learned that, that, that at times I won't even try something new. I won't go out on a limb because I don't want to fail. I don't want to be embarrassed or humiliated in front of others. So if I don't think I can do it with a reasonable certainty of success or do it up to a standard that to try something new because I didn't want to fail, I, think, I didn't think I could do it with success. And so as I've started realizing that about myself and realizing that's not a healthy thing, that's not a good thing to have, I've tried to start you know, stretching myself and doing things intentionally done over the last several years is I've tried to teach myself woodworking. 
which is not something I grew up doing at all. Nothing in my family, in my household that would, that would uh, have given me any kind of experience doing that. But I decided one day that I wanted to have some cornhole boards. And another thing about me is I'm cheap, and so I didn't want to pay the $100, $150 for them. And so I decided I was going to make them. So I bought some of the tools and things I needed to, uh, to make. I had saws and drills, and, and, and I watched a YouTube video on how to make them. And I made two cornhole boards. And if you come to my house this afternoon, we could pull them out and we could play on them. We could use them. They're, they're workable cornhole boards. But the thing is, is that every time I pull them out still today, I, I recognize and see that they're not perfect. It doesn't exactly fit together at 90 degree angles in, in a couple of places. And the circle in the middle is not an exact circle uh, that you try to throw the, the bean bags through. And as I pull them out and use them, and we had a young adult uh, dinner out here over the summer in the pavilion, I brought them out so some of our young adults could play on it. And, and I remember even then having this emotion come up inside of me that made me almost want to apologize to them for these cornhole boards not being perfect. We're in week two of this series called The Gifts of Imperfection, which is a book uh, titled that. Uh, it's based on a book by uh, Dr. Brene Brown by that name, Gifts of Imperfection. Uh, and, and each week, uh, we're going to talk about five of the chapters in the book. And, and in the book, she has ten certain things that she feels like we need to give up, that we need to let go of to have a healthier, happier life. I would say more of a God-ordained life in our perspective. Um, and, and, and in giving those things up, things that we can cultivate in their place that are healthier for us and are, are better suited for us to live with. Last week, we talked about how we need to give up what other people think about us and instead cultivate authenticity in our lives. And today we're going to talk about giving up perfectionism. And by perfectionism, Dr. Brown has this to say about it. She says, perfectionism is not the same as striving to do your best. In fact, perfectionism is not about healthy achievement and growth at all. Perfectionism is about a false understanding that if we can just do everything perfectly, then we will not have to deal with the pain, blame, and shame that the world throws at us. Perfectionism is not self-improvement. Perfectionism is, at its core, about trying to earn approval and acceptance. And by the way, I have these on the notes page of our bulletin. If you, if you want to flip it over on the back, you can see them. And that's so that if you want to take these home, if these things resonate with you, they're right there. You don't have to scramble to write them down. Brown goes on to talk about perfectionism with this. She says, perfectionism is self-destructive. First of all, period. Perfectionism is self-destructive. But she says it's self-destructive because, one, it's an addictive belief system that has unattainable goals. Number two, there's no such thing as perfect. Number three, when we do experience shame, judgment, and blame, we often believe it's because we weren't perfect enough. And number four, feeling shamed, judged, and blamed are realities of the human experience. In other words, this is not something unique to us. This is something that every human, that all of us feel at times. We feel the realities of the world of being shamed, judged, or blamed for things. And in fact, throughout this whole chapter, she makes a strong correlation between shame, judgment, and blame, and perfectionism. And as a recovering perfectionist, I would say that a loud amen to that, that that is an absolutely true thing. That for those of us who struggle with perfectionism, then the motivating factor behind that for us is oftentimes shame, not wanting to be embarrassed, not wanting to let somebody down, not wanting to fail at something about not wanting to have the blame cast on us or feel the judgment of others when oftentimes really that judgment is just self-judgment, judgment that comes from within us. I judge myself that, that I should have known better. What an idiot you are for not doing a better job of strapping that down or, or disassembling it before you move it. What an idiot you are for not being able to do better with making cornhole boards. That judgment comes from within and, and it continues to foster that, uh, that perfectionism inside of us. And so in turn... Brown says that we need to let go of that perfectionism in us, and instead we need to cultivate an attitude of self-compassion. And by self-compassion, Brown says that self-compassion centers around cutting yourself some slack. 
being kind to yourself and recognizing that the feeling of inadequacy is part of our humanity that every person experiences. That's a powerful, powerful statement and one that just sort of eases my anxieties as I read it and hear it spoken. I need to cut myself some slack and recognize that that feeling of inadequacy is common to all human experiences that I need to be kind to myself. It feels good just to hear that spoken because we don't speak it enough. In our scripture for today that Pastor Bucky read, uh, Jesus is beginning uh, his ministry really, and this is his first uh, major oration, major sermon that he gives. Oftentimes we refer to it as the Sermon on the Mount. And what we read today is just a very small, just a few verses of this three-chapter monologue that Jesus gives. Uh, but in it, he, he says what we read today, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And oftentimes we misunderstand that, and that was sort of created us some of those thoughts that this perfectionism thing maybe is the right way to go, that, that Jesus expects us to be perfect just as God is perfect. And so I want us to understand exactly what it is and is not that Jesus is saying in this text, because I think that, that there's something important for us that we're missing out on when we don't understand that. And so uh, really the way we can understand this is, is um, of anybody, us Methodists, us Wesleyans should understand that because the way the world really understands the truth in this text comes from our spiritual father, John Wesley. Wesley created a doctrine of Christian perfection of what Jesus is saying in this text that is really widely accepted throughout Christendom as the understanding of how we should take this statement from Jesus to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And in that, um, Wesley says that what we need to do to understand this is to understand the context, the immediate context around what Jesus is saying. Leading up to this statement, he tells us that we need to love our enemies, pray for those who persecute us, and do good to those who hate us. And then he goes on to say, you know, if we only love those who love us, then what good is that? Everybody does that. The pagans do that. The heathens do that. Everybody loves those who love us. That that's not what we're called to do. We're called to a higher love, a bigger love, a more all-encompassing love. And he comes to that point and he says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And so Wesley says, rightfully I believe, that when we talk about what it means to be perfect, Jesus is not saying that we have to be perfect in all aspects of our life, that there's no room for failure, that there's no room for us to fall or to make mistakes. But he said that the, the desire that we should have to be perfect is the desire to be perfect in love. Is a desire to love perfectly just as we are perfectly loved by God. That it's God who loves perfectly, a love that never gives up or runs out on us, and that it's that that we should seek to emulate in our lives. And perfect love is something that Jesus talks about often. In fact, telling us that it's perfect love that casts out all fear. That perfect love that allows us to be secure in the arms of God. And in fact, it's that love, really a perfect love, and he elaborates on it when, when he was trying to be trapped by, uh, by, by a rich young ruler who came to him and said, what's the most important of all the laws, thinking he had Jesus trapped? And Jesus said, well, the whole law can really be summed up like this. The greatest of all the commandments is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself is one that's just like it. And that's the way you sum up the whole law, is in love of God and love of neighbor and we know that and even if we don't practice it perfectly we understand of, if we read scripture that it, it's important for us to try to work and get better at how we love God with everything we have our heart mind soul and strength and to to try to do better at today than we were doing yesterday and we know specifically that Jesus calls us to love our neighbor and and, and he does a good job if, if you if you don't remember right after this he they said, who is my neighbor? And he, he, he gives the, the parable of the Good Samaritan that we know about who our neighbor is. And it's not just those people we like or we want to sit with on the pew with us on Sunday mornings. It's oftentimes that person that's totally different from us, that person that oftentimes we may find despicable that we're called to love our neighbor means a call to love really anyone we come in contact with. 
And so he describes this perfect love as about loving God and loving our neighbor, humans. But there's a third component of this that oftentimes we miss. Because we understand the importance of loving God and we understand the importance of loving neighbor. But he says in that, love your neighbor as yourself. There's a call in the perfect law of love that sums up all of the law to love ourselves. To show self-compassion. To cut ourselves some slack. And I'm not sure at times we do a good job of that. We tend to fall on the side of saying, Ryan, you're an idiot. Instead of saying, Ryan, it's okay. You're not perfect. Because here's the thing, in the text we read at the very beginning, Paul's writing a letter to the church at Rome, and one of the things that he feels like it's important to tell these Roman people here, and, and oftentimes these are folks that, that don't have a whole lot of experience of the faith, or they're, they're from that Western sort of mindset, that Western religion, and so Paul's having to give them some details of what it means to be a follower of God as evidenced through Jesus. Jesus is the one who's drawn them into the faith, and, and he says that, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us. He's reminding us that, that there's only one that's perfect, and that's Jesus. The rest of us have fallen short of that. The rest of us have messed up, have made mistakes, that not one is perfect. And we need to be reminded of that perfection as a totality is unattainable, and that we need to understand that God created us as humans not to be perfect. He didn't create us perfect, he created us as humans. Now, God desires for us to strive to do our best. He expects our best from us. But when we mess up, when we make mistakes, when we fall short of that expectation, contrary to, to, to whatever you've heard in your life, and at times you may have even heard it from the church, and it's wrong. Contrary to that, when we mess up, God is not in the business of blame, shame, and judgment. That's just not who God is. God is in the business of picking us up, dusting us off, and saying, let's try again. And giving us a second chance, and a third chance, and a tenth chance, and a hundred chance. That's who God is. The God who shows perfect love offers us perfect grace time and time again when we mess up and fall short and do not achieve perfection. And so I want to challenge you today, church, to cut yourself some slack. To ease off and not be so hard on yourself today. To allow yourself to recognize that, that you're part of that, that Paul talked about, who have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then I want you to claim the grace of God in your life. A love that has never given up on you, never run out, never left you once. As you claim it in your life, to begin to realize that you can have compassion for yourself. As you seek to love God and love your neighbor, you can also love yourself. And in doing so, we can grow closer to that perfect love that Jesus calls us to. Thanks be to God. Be found on page 369, and your hymn will be on the screens as well. I invite you to stand as you're able, and let's sing together, Blessed Assurance.
Our ushers will receive God's tithes and our offerings.
We'll be using our spoken responses this morning. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. You healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And when the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so it is in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, that we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ Christ has died. died. Christ Christ is risen. risen. Christ Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please know that this is our Lord's table, and Jesus invites you uh, to come to his table and to eat. Uh, if you uh, would like, you just come down the aisle. Ushers will invite you to come forward. Uh, we'll break off a piece of bread, hand it to you. You'll dip it in the chalice. And then you'll eat, and then you can spend as much time either kneeling or standing by the chancel rail in prayer before returning to your seat. If you need a gluten-free option, you can go to either side and just ask for it, and we will be glad to serve you a uh, gluten-free communion elements. And then if you're unable to come forward, uh, please know that the ushers will be looking for you and will come and offer you communion in your seat. This is your time. Come as you're led.
So teach my soul to rise to you when temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand up on you, well, Jesus, you're my hope and stay.
Will you stand for your benediction? As you leave here, I encourage you once again to show yourself some slack this week. To seek God's perfect love out in your life and try to get better in how you love God, love each other, and love yourself. Go in peace. Our um, closing song, there's a misprint in the uh, order of worship. It is hymn number 98.